It used to be 20, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it used to be a lot. Yeah. As was said by mistake many years ago, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the audio radiance. <laughs> Those of you who have been here before know that we did the Holland land purchase last time. And today with, with Chuck Lachusa in Florida, I am uh, covering the Niagara Daredevils. If you've read the first slide, you probably are wondering, what is a funambulist? That is a term that is used for people who tightrope walk. And that's what we'll see some of those, like Blondin, in the program tonight. And this book here, Queen of the Mist, I edited for Dr. Parrish many years ago, who unfortunately died before I got it published. So I did the editing and there's a copy of it in our library here under biography. Well, were these people courteous, uh, courageous or foolhardy? That's the question and I guess we'll let you make up your mind yourself. So let's see where we're talking about next. So most of what we're talking about will happen either here at the falls itself or around the Whirlpool suspension bridges. So some of the phenomenalists crossed here where Philip Petit did a few years ago, but many of them were near the suspension bridge because a paying audience could stand on the bridge and uh, see it also. Okay, next one. It goes way back to 1829 with uh, Sam Patch. Sam Patch was uh, oh, uh, kind of an odd character. He loved jumping off bridges into rivers. He did it in Rhode Island, Pawtucket. He did it in Patterson, New Jersey. He decided it would ultimately be more fun to do that at Niagara Falls. However, the falls itself was a little bit intimidating. So he came with ladders. He started out with a 90-foot ladder at the base of Goat Island. He would jump successfully into the water pool down below Niagara Falls. And then later on, he put up a 130-foot ladder. Now the falls itself is about 180 feet down there. But he was successful here, drew a good crowd, made some money. He moved on to Rochester and he did the same thing at the Genesee Falls, except one time he didn't come back up. And they found his body down at the end of the Genesee River by Lake Ontario. So that was not such a successful phenomenalist. Okay. The most famous one of the 19th century in the 19th century, remember, in the 19th century, most people never got more than 30 miles from home. So if they could see somebody from elsewhere in the world or somebody who had a good reputation, they would flock to the area and pay good money, sometimes 10 cents, 15 cents, 25 cents, to see these different acts. There was no television at home and they were nowhere near being, so many who were farmers, they were nowhere near, nowhere near a uh, show of any kind. So Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondin, was the next one we're going to talk about here. So, next one. There's one of his advertising posters. And there's the bicycle that he would use. Now, this interesting bicycle, remember the safety bicycle, safety bicycle was not invented until late in the 19th century. Bicycles were a penny farthing, as they called them in those days, uh, the high wheel in front or in the back. But this is kind of the first safety bicycle. Back up for a minute. 
it has grooves in there. And uh, if you look at the front wheel, there's something that looks like the ability to push on some kind of a primitive pedal. But anyway, he would use that in some of his acts. Now, now you go to the next one. This was not a very clear picture, but it shows a wheelbarrow, which is over at the uh, museum on the Canadian side, that he would push across. Now, one of the things he did with this wheelbarrow was to take out a stove and cook a meal. And then he would lower that down to the people on the Maid of the Mist that had paid a good buck to have a meal that had been prepared on a high wire. <laughs> he also would walk backwards. And uh, he offered one time to the audience on one side, he said, I'm looking for somebody to carry on my back across here. You remember about how many volunteers he'd get for that. So he, uh, he persuaded his manager, Harry Colcord, to cross with him on his back. And there's Harry Colcord up there, who was sure was quaking in his boots. But they did make it successfully across. Later on in 1860, when the Prince of Wales visited Canada here and dedicated that monument over at uh, <clears throat> Queenston, he offered the future Edward VII, King of England, he offered him a ride across on the highway. I'm sure Bertie, as he was often called, Bertie thought, well, you know, I'd like to actually get to be king someday. So he didn't realize it was be another 41 years before he be king. But yeah, sure enough, in 1901, he did become king. And it's kind of repeating itself again with Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Victoria lived longer than any other monarch in England until Elizabeth outlived him. Is she Elizabeth II now? Okay. Now, that was in July, Independence Day area. Signor Farini came over in September, September the 5th, and came out with this advertising poster. And he needed to do something different also, so he had a little act that he played. He called himself Farini the Comical. And Signor Farini will on Wednesday, and so on. He would play the part of the Biddy O'Flaherty, Irish washerwoman. And he went out on the tightrope with a washing machine, not like the one you have in your house. Next picture. Now here he is on the high wire alone as a, as a practicing phenomenon, but there's his washing machine. He set that up and he had wash. He did a complete wash and hung it to dry and then took everything back again. He also, as I said, lowered a bottle of water one time, which they filled with from the river water. He hauled it back up and drank the river water. It's a wonder that didn't kill him. <laughs> okay, the next one. And there's another imposter, Signor Bellini. Apparently he was an Australian, but he also did the same thing. But this high wire was not near the Whirlpool Bridge. This high wire was very close to Prospect Point on the falls. Now, you wonder how, how thick the wire was that they walked on. They varied in thickness, but around two inches thick for a cable was more or less the average. Okay. He had a little act here. Senor Bellini would pretend to fall. There he is falling, but he had a giant bungee cord on him. And so partway down to the river water, this bungee cord would stop him from falling and killing himself. He did that several times. Unfortunately, 
one time the bungee cord broke. Oh. Well, he did survive, but he got an awful ducking in the river. Now, Matthew Webb was a very successful swimmer. He swam, among other things, the first man, apparently, to swim the English Channel. And he came and said he's going to swim the length of the rapids from the falls down to Lewiston area. So he did. The only problem is when he came out the other end, he wasn't alive anymore. He had drowned. Okay. Then there was William Kendall and his cork life preserver. He thought he would try it. He didn't make it either. Next one. There was <coughs> Charles Percy, who was no relative that we know of. <laughs> but he came along. Oh, no, let's go back to Charles. He came along and he had a rowboat and he did make it successfully. He came out the other end down there. And uh, there's a uh, gallery of these people on the Canadian side, the, what used to be called the Great Gorge Route. There's a place just beyond the Whirlpool Rapids Bridge. I'm not sure what they call it now, but you go down an elevator after you pay, of course. And you go through a long tunnel out to a boardwalk right next to the rapids. Very interesting place. But in that tunnel, there's pictures of all these different uh, <clears throat> phenambulists. Oh, OK. Now, Clifford Calverly came over. He was a, a resident of Toronto. And he came over wasn't even interested in making any money from it. He just wanted to sh see if he could do it. So on his, you know, it's one of those little hobbies you have along, oh, there's a tightrope. It was still left up there by somebody else. I'll just see if I walk across that. So I would suggest you not try that, but uh, anyway, he made it. Okay. Samuel Dixon, here he is. You can see the weights that are hung off the rope there on the far side. Now this is a different bridge. This is a cantilever bridge that was put up around the turn of the 20th century for the railroad, the Michigan Central Railroad. It's right next to the World Rapids Bridge. If we look at this picture here, the World Pool Rapids Bridge would be just off the picture over here. This bridge was replaced in 18 or 1925 by the current bridge that's there because uh, the trains got heavier and it was more stress on this cantilever style than they thought was safe. I do have another program, by the way, on the bridges over the Niagara River. Okay. There's Clifford Calverly sitting in a chair he set up. There he is. Took a chair out with him. I guess he got tired, sat down in the chair and had a nice rest and then got back up and walked off with his chair. That's the cantilever bridge again. There's Clifford Calverly who came back again. It wasn't enough to do it just once. So here he is with his wheelbarrow. So more than one person had wheelbarrows and went out there with something to do to carry out with a wheelbarrow. Okay. Stephen Peer. Now Stephen Peer had a fatal attraction to crossing the falls. And he was successful in crossing. And that's, that's the Whirlpool Rapids Bridge in the background when it was still a suspension bridge. You know that bridge is still there, except it's no longer a suspension bridge. They took all the suspension down years ago and built the framework that's there now. But uh, he was celebrating one night in a Canadian bar. Had a few, maybe a Labatt's Blue or who knows. He was dared by somebody. Could you do that at night? Some of the others had. So he went 
and got set up to walk across. He only got a few feet and he fell. He was drunk and he was killed. Now, we come upstream a bit to the barrel riders. Oh, wait, okay. I forgot to tell you about Maria Spelterina. She was a very successful funambulist. She had all the people lined up on the suspension bridge or there. She was an Italian gal, and she wore a very revealing suit. It was a body-colored suit. And so the guys were up there with their eyes popping out. <clears throat> she walked across with peach baskets on her feet. She walked across backwards. She walked across doing acrobatics at times on there. <clears throat> it was some part of celebrating our nation's centennial. But anyway, she did very well and was probably one of the most successful funambulists besides Blondin at the uh, falls. Okay. <clears throat> now there's, there are some of the barrels that are at the museum over there. As you can see, uh, this one doesn't look like it's in very good shape. There's Annie Taylor's barrel. And this is... Uh, Oh, I forgot who this belonged to this one, but some of these barrels worked and some of them didn't. Okay. <clears throat> Carl L. Graham, there's his barrel. You can see it's taller than he is. He uh, made the trip successfully. And then uh, somebody would like to borrow it. They thought, gee, that's such a good idea. Let's go through the world of rapids in a barrel. There's nothing else to do, you know. Okay, next one. So there is Maud Willard. She borrowed the barrel and she took a little dog with her and she had an air hole in the barrel so she could breathe in case she was in there too long. She went down to the Whirlpool Rabbit and uh, <clears throat> when she was brought ashore, she was dead. She had suffocated. The little dog had hogged the hole and got to breathe, and she didn't. So that was a, a problem. Okay, next one. Now, the, <clears throat> the first person to actually go over the falls and live in a barrel was Annie Taylor. Now, Annie Taylor, you, you might find her story interesting if you look at the book. She was a, a teacher, she said, she has a rather colorful history. She's traveled all over the country at different times, and she was now passing herself off as a 43-year-old woman who was going to make money by going over the, pier, the uh, Niagara Falls while the Pan American Exposition was going on in Buffalo. And she was at the Pan American Exposition and talked. But she thought she could make a lot of money that way. So she uh, went through a number of managers. She had the barrel built by a cooper in Michigan where she lived, among other places. <clears throat> it was a sturdy oak barrel. Next one. There she is with a barrel. And her manager thought it'd be a good idea, first of all, to see if anybody could survive going over the falls. So he got a stray cat called Iagara, one of the historic names for Niagara. And they sent the barrel over the falls with the cat in it. And uh, <clears throat> the cat survived, although I'm sure it was a bit scared. It was like, uh, I had a similar situation. Years ago, I took my son, Alan, who's in the back there helping me. He's my oldest son. I took him down to see the Broadway parade one Saturday morning. 
came out of the car, garage, backed the car out. There were strange noises going on under the hood of my car. Well, I didn't think too much of it. It was a Dodge Dart with a slant six. There was plenty of room for an animal to live on there. We got down to Sycamore Street, the closest place I could find to park. There was an elderly lady walking with a cane on the sidewalk as I opened the hood and the cat went up like that. I swear that woman didn't need a cane to move fast. <laughs> the cat disappeared. It was my neighbor's cat across the street, a purebred Siamese. But the Buffalo News put the little article about what happened in the paper and a week later, the cat was returned. So the thing is, if you have a warm motor on your car, it's a cold night out, check under the hood, make sure there's not a cat under there <laughs> keeping warm. Anyway, Iagara, I guess disappeared. I don't think she went over with the cat in the barrel. But anyway, there's the barrel. Okay, next one. And there she is getting in the barrel, lots of cushioning. Okay. And they tried to get a couple guys to row her out and just above the Niagara Rapids. Yeah, the first few people backed out. But she finally found a couple of dimwits that would, <laughs> would take her out in a boat and release her barrel above the Niagara Rapids. So here they are, hollering on Truesdale at the launch. There she is in the barrel. Okay. She went over the, over the falls, and here she is being brought back up from the foot of the falls. I think it's the base of Grand Island, not Grand Island, Goat Island, where uh, that first ladder thing was done. And she was well shaken up, but alive, but they took her to a hospital. Apparently one of the things she says is, anybody should never do something like that. Well, I think that would have been a good advice before she did it. But she did successfully do it, so she went on to, oh wait, there's a picture of her actually, yeah, go back a minute. There's a picture of her actually being brought onto dry land, <clears throat> if it can be called dry below the falls. And the fella on the left there is Red Hill, who is a very famous, uh, barrel rider of Niagara Falls, and his family, several generations later, is still active in rescuing people from the falls area. Okay. Now, this was a woman who decided the opportunity to gather the money from people who would reward Annie Taylor for her story. So she was an imposter, and uh, she did go through the Niagara Rapids, but the way her broadside here said over Niagara Falls in a barrel, that's not true. She didn't go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. She did, uh, did however, use, I believe it was one of the barrels that had been used before, and uh, <clears throat> she uh, did put her little table out on the streets of the Niagara Falls and tourists would come by and gave her money. Whereas poor Annie Taylor was in the hospital for a while and then went down to Buffalo and she didn't do well. This was a young woman, pretty woman and a charming woman. And Annie Taylor was not 43 as she purported. She was actually 63 years old and she had a gravelly voice, and she just did not attract money, or people could listen to her, but she didn't make much. Next one. So here's Martha Wagenfjord, who navigated the Whirlpool Rapids unsuccessfully. Here's Annie Taylor selling mementos in her declining years. The one thing she didn't want to do was to end up in a poorhouse. 
There were no teachers' pensions in those days. So she thought she could make enough money that she could survive, but next. Here's where she ended up and died, the Niagara County Infirmary in Lockport. So it's not always such a good idea to, well, to go over a falls or anything else dangerous. Okay, next now. <clears throat> now, somebody else decided to go over the falls too. Bobby Leach went over in 1911. And he was banged up. He had two broken knees. And he was, had some facial cuts. But he did survive, and then he went around the world demonstrating with his barrel. How did he end up? Well, but he was in Australia. He was crossing the street. He stepped on a banana peel, slipped and fell, and blood poisoning took his life. So going over the falls is safer than stepping on a banana peel. Here's Bobby Leach with his barrel. That must have been his barrel that's in that museum, that long one we saw. But here he is getting his picture taken. Okay. Now we had another fellow, Lincoln Beachy, who took off in this wonderful airplane uh, down on Humboldt Parkway. And he flew over Fort Erie and then down the Canadian side to the falls to fly under a bridge. So here he is flying under the upper Niagara Arch Bridge near where the Rainbow Bridge is now. He made it. The only problem was he got down there and, and he couldn't pull up again because of the winds. You know, he just had, didn't have the technical knowledge. But he did manage to make it up. But he wasn't able to get back up and over the Whirlpool Rapids Bridge until the last moment. Otherwise, he would have crashed into it. There's the Maid of the Mist down under, underneath there. The one that where probably you and I rode on. I still own my ticket from that uh, Maid of the Mist ride I took in 1948. 95 cents. Anybody gone recently? You know, it's, I think it's over $20 now. In those days, it was nice you had a steamboat and they had black rubber raincoats, which I think were from the Noah's Ark era. era. They had all the same smells. And the soot from the steamboat managed to cover your face and any place else. You came out, you looked like you might have been a different race. Okay. Now there's Red Hill Senior, the one we saw before and his hero of Niagara Barrel. He made several trips to the Niagara Rapids, but nobody ever convinced him to go over the falls. He said, you want me to kill myself? <laughs> okay, next. Now, Charles Stevens came over in 1920, and he decided to put an anvil inside his barrel. So there's his uh, setup there. There's the anvil down there. So Charles Stevens was not a successful barrel rider. They found him in, I believe, more than one piece. The anvil went right through the bottom of the barrel. Next one. Now here's June Luc Lucier his barrel here, right at the peak of the falls, as it just went over. He had a big rubber barrel, which we'll see again shortly here. Next picture. But before we do, here's George Dukakis, a man who did not learn. He decided to use this rowboat above the falls and then coast down and go over the falls. He had an anvil also, but he decided he would have the anvil tied to his feet inside the barrel. So after a 180 foot drop, the anvil 
kept right on going. And so did George Dukakis, or parts of him. They found several parts down below. <clears throat> they never found the anvil, but they found whatever was not tied to the anvil. So he was a, a Greek who apparently didn't know much about English or had not read about it. Okay. Here's Red Hill Jr., the son of Red Hill Sr. and his barrel in the rapids. There's the barrel. You know, some of those waves in the rapids there get up to 40 feet high. And, uh, and he did make successful trips down through it. It was a matter of good planning, okay. Then there's Red Hill Jr. deciding in, I think it was about 1948. It's right after World War II. I know I was, a, I was a teenager at that time. There was a popular song, remember, in those days, get out of here with that, and don't come back no more. Maybe some of you remember that. I used to sing that to myself on my paper route. Well, it's made up of truck inner tubes and canvas netting around it. He thought it was an ideal way to go over the falls without a barrel. Well, let's take a look and see what it looked like. There it is. It just came apart going over the falls and killed him. Fortunately, it had children already by that time. Okay. Now there's Roger Woodward. You may remember this one also, about 1961 or so. And you remember he and his uncle and his sister were in a rowboat in the upper rapids and their motor stalled. And the uncle pulled and pulled and pulled and they got closer and closer to the edge and then overturned in the upper rapids and the uncle, and I, I'm trying to remember now, I know the uncle went over the falls, but the, uh, the girl, I believe, was rescued just at the brink of the falls, if I remember right. But I remember Roger went over the falls, and he's the first person we know of that went over the falls and survived without any kind of a barrel protection. Next one. Here he is being rescued, 1960 he was, being rescued here. He had a life preserver on, and of course he was a small boy, seven years old. He was light enough and he didn't hit the rocks below. One, one of the dangers is if you go over the falls, you might come up behind the falls and be trapped behind there for hours and hours before it spits you out after you drowned. So he was a lucky boy. He came back a few years ago to show his family the site of his adventure. And again, he shook his head, I can't believe I made it. <laughs> okay. Now, Nathan Boya did a lot of planning here. And this is what he set up to come over here. You can see 12 small inner tubes, six truck inner tubes, an escape hatch, a hinge for the door here, individual snorkels and check valves, keep water out, but allow air in to enter after surfacing. So he uh, was well prepared. He called it the splungosphere. There's 150 pounds of buckshot down here for weight. No more anvils. Next one. Well, he went over in 1961, and the boat came up, they opened the hatch, and tried to get him to come out. He says, no, I haven't gone over the falls yet. Yes, you have. No, I haven't. I, I didn't feel it. Well, they finally persuaded him to come out, and uh, he survived fine. No damage. Next one. Here's a Picture rescuing him, or attempting to rescue him anyway. Next one. And there he is with a nurse. They took him in for a checkup. 
he is okay. I don't know that he was okay. I think he was a bit off his rocker. <laughs> okay. Now, in 1972, they were running raft rides down through the Niagara Lower Rapids, down to the Whirlpool. And there they are. However, one person went overboard, and that's why they don't run those raft rides anymore. The person went overboard, they didn't save. However, you can get close to that by uh, going on one of those jet boats down either in Lewiston or Queenston. I know my wife and I went on that back when she could still walk. And, uh, well, you have to be prepared to get wet. They give you a raincoat. That's a joke. <laughs> it just holds the water in underneath the raincoat because they go through and they jump waves and you splash over. And, uh, but it's a very exciting ride if you're probably under 50. <laughs> okay. There's a kayak, a kayak become popular, kayaking has become popular. So there's a man going through in a kayak, which survived. The rapids, he survived the rapids, but not the fall. I, he you're not, the rapids, yeah, the rapids. After the falls. Yes, after the falls, okay. right from the, <laughs> the base of the falls down to uh, yes. okay. Lewiston, yeah. <clears throat> Here's Carol Susick in his barrel. He had all kinds of safety equipment in it. And next one. But by this time, the uh, Canadian government said that it was illegal and you could be arrested for doing that. So here he is over on the Canadian side, by the upper, almost at the upper rapids, sneaking his barrel with help into the river. And next one. There's his barrel at the brink. This is the brink of the falls here. He used this for publicity. Okay. So he was successful. So Steve Trotter came along in what he called a pickle barrel. And the pickle barrel had all kinds of rubber inner tubes on it and so on. He was even more prepared. The thing weighed a ton. And the next one. So he got part way down the rapids and got beached. So there he is being beached. However, he was not going to give up. So he did try again and he did make it. Okay. And then David, John David Mundy tried the same thing with his barrel. And again, they all had individual unique ways of creating their barrels. Next one. So here's Dave Mundy stranded. This is being lifted ashore by a crane here. But he did eventually make it over the falls too. Okay. And here's another child being rescued from the brink. You see the park police here holding out his hand and he did grab his hand right here at Prospect Point, or it might have been a might have been over on the Canadian side. I'm not sure. But whoever took this picture, it looks like he's standing in the air outside. I don't know if it's a, a drone or what, but I thought that was a quite unique picture. There's another picture I saw one time of a fella who decided to go over in a jet ski. He figured he'd go out over the Canadian Falls in a jet ski, release a parachute, and just drift down carefully and safely to the water below. Didn't work. The chute did not uh, <clears throat> deploy. And so, see there are some other people, since I made this program, have gone over a two-man, that's a Peter G. Bernardi and Jeffrey Perk Petkovich were the first people to make it as a two-man trip. One had a D. Bernardi. D. Bernardi 
had the idea, and Jeff decided to go along for the ride. In case you get any ideas, maybe you can always hitch up with somebody. Jesse Sharp <laughs> tried it in a kayak. Not too smart. Steve Trotter went over again later with Lori Martin, and they were successful. And then over Robert Overacker is the one I talked about with the jet ski. Also, there are a couple of Niagara University students who decided they would go over in a canoe. I don't have any pictures of them, but they were on the upper part of Goat Island with their canoe and were ready to launch and they were <coughs> arrested by the park police. And then, because of their intellectual level, they were denied further enrollment at Niagara University. You're too stupid to go to, <laughs> you're gonna go to the falls in a canoe. You're too dumb to be a college student. Okay, next one. And there we are. Okay, that's, that's all of it. Thank you. I'll take any questions, though. Yes, Ken. What is the law now on both sides? Oh, it's, a, it's against the law to even do it. I'll tell you, I, I tried something. When I released this book for publicity, I had a small barrel. We were going to go over the falls in a barrel with some of these books in it. I was threatened with a $5,000 fine if I did that. And that was not even a person. <laughs> but what is the law now regarding a, a walk over the uh, payroll? Well, they do make exceptions of it for professionals like, like Philip. That is legal. Yeah, like that was legal. It was done illegally not too long ago. Well, yeah, it's, it's illegal for anybody unless they get special permission. And it was very difficult for him to get that permission too. But he's the same guy that walked between the Twin Towers in New York. Right. You know. What's the name? Melinda. Name Melinda. 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 Melinda family, right? Yeah. Yeah, that family. Mm -hmm. Yes? How did you uh, get the cable across the area in the early days? The cable that they walked on? Yeah. The wire. Yeah, there, there was a... Oh, yeah, well, that's why they were near the bridge. That was one thing they could do. They could take it across on the bridge, the other end, or they could take it across on a boat. I think most likely they took it across on a boat. Not being there, I can't tell you for sure. <laughs> yes. Thunderbird Ridge, a Girl Scout camp, and one of them had just gone, I don't know if it was just the, it was she, he walked on that wire. He, he didn't go over the falls, but he walked on the wire. So my daughter, in imitating him, she climbed up on the log, which was only a foot off the ground, and she promptly fell, had two compound broken elbows, Okay. All from her adventure of standing one foot. <laughs> Good thing you didn't try the falls. <laughs> wow. Well, you never know. I, I shattered this left shoulder of mine oh, five or six years ago, just tripping over a high curb in February and going down on concrete. I had to have this whole elbow rebuilt. So I have a bionic shoulder here. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that takes care of us for this month. Thank you for your attendance. And thank you for your assistance. You're welcome.